the optimal systolic blood pressure treatment goal is actually in question given the results of the sprint trial suggesting benefit for 120 millimeters of mercury. However, what does achieving that level of systolic pressure mean for diastolic pressure? And what happens when you hit the systolic and then you get a corresponding reduction in diastolic blood pressure too? That is the subject of a great paper that was in the October 18th issue of Jack diastolic blood pressure, subclinical myocardial damage, and cardiac events, and the implications for blood pressure control. To talk about this, I'm with Dr. Christy Ballantyne, who is director of the Center for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at Methodist Dubuque Hospital, and uh, also the uh, director of the Atherosclerosis Clinical Research Laboratory at Baylor. Okay, let's start with the brief reminder of SPRINT and why what you're talking about in this paper is so important. So SPRINT was a landmark study in which they treated people to much more, and there were high risk individuals, right. treated to more aggressive targets to get a systolic blood pressure of less than 120, and stopped early for mortality. So it's, it's really a game changer in terms of how we tr look at treating high risk individuals with hypertension. Now, systolic is what everybody seems to be, occasionally you'll see a diastolic paper, but it's rare that you actually talk about both, the, the, the issue of, of one or the other. Where did your paper come from? Why did you decide that this really needed to be looked at? Well, the, the challenge ends up being is for cardiologists is that they treat a lot of patients with coronary disease. And they treat older patients also. Right. And so what we also see is there are people who have, uh, they may have a systolic that's elevated, but they have a wide pulse pressure gradient and they have a low diastolic pressure. So one of the things we've measured in the, in the atherosclerosis risk community study is uh, levels of high sensitivity to troponin T over multiple visits. And so this was a study of middle-aged individuals. At this first visit was the second visit, their average age, age was around 56. And it looked at the individuals with low diastolic pressures and looked at the, this marker of troponin, uh, which is released. These are assays where we're below the detection right now in the, what we have available in the United States. And it saw an association that individuals who had low diastolic pressure were more likely to have increased levels of troponin. Now, in addition, over time, they had more events uh, with it. And in fact, it turns out that the pulse pressure gradient, so the person who has a systolic of less than 60, excuse me, a diastolic of less than 60 and a systolic of over, of over 120, so a pulse pressure gradient of greater than 60 was at risk for having these increased markers of uh, troponin and also for developing coronary events. Right. Now, the low diastolic pressure predicted coronary events, but not stroke. So it goes, you know, we've always thought systolic pressure, key for the brain, but there's always been some concerns that for, in particular with people who have obstructive coronary disease that you have to be careful about diastolic pressure. I mean, this is a pretty good large analysis from Eric, 11,500 adults. So what is the take-home message? I mean, when, when you look at what you found, what's the take-home? Well, I think that the, the take-home is probably right now. I, I think we still, we want to be treating people aggressively for their blood pressure. But I do think when you're, and it's always been the challenge of treating blood pressure, is that there are some individuals who have wide pulse pressure gradients, they get stiff arteries, and when you're treating them aggressively, you need to watch the diastolic pressure. Because if you're getting down in the range of 40 or 50, and in particular if they're having symptoms, right. now we have to be concerned that perhaps for that individual, it may not be the best approach. We need more data. We'll try to work with a SPRINT study and hopefully measure these same markers in SPRINT to see if we see the same findings. Were you surprised at all by, the, by what you found you know, when you took a look at the troponins and saw what kind of... Well, damage it, might be going you on. You know, I think there's a, and there's a very nice uh, editorial by Deepak Bach about this in the REACH registry. And there's been a concern, you know, we've, for, for cardiologists about, uh, for a long time, this issue of the, the, the filling of the, of, the, of, the, of the coronary arteries is during diastole. So if you, have, if you have a low diastolic pressure, particularly if it's too low, and if you have a thick ventricle, uh, then you might have problems. And people who have Stiff arteries with wide pulse pressure gradients, they have usually thick ventricles and they have low diastolic pressure. So if you bring that way down, could get into trouble. 
I guess the last question is, because there is such a debate, debate now regarding what is the optimal target after a sprint, where do you fall along the debate? Where should we be targeting high-risk patients? I, I still think that, uh, and, and one of the things we have to look at is what's the risk for heart failure? Okay. And we don't think of this traditionally, but if someone, particularly, you can actually calculate heart failure risk. Uh, we, there's an equation out of Eric that does that. But if someone has a high heart failure risk, I think that in general you're gonna do benefit lowering that systolic to less than 120. If they have obstructive coronary disease, now we have to use some clinical judgment in terms of yes, be aggressive, but look at that diastolic pressure. And if you're getting well below 60, uh, then you, you, you may, have, may have to back off a little bit. Well, thank you very much, because this is a paper that I thought was fascinating, and I really wanted to get a chance to chat with you. I know we tried at ESC, didn't quite make it, so yeah, I'm glad you really, had some it's, chance. It's, it's, it's a neat paper. It really is. It's in the October 18th issue of JAK, and it is diastolic blood pressure, subclinical myocardial damage, and cardiac events. And for Cardiosource World News and Cardiosource World News Interventions, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.